Thanks very much. I've got a, a good bit to get through um, because obviously it's a topic we are all very interested in. But I also am conscious that it's a topic that everyone has a lot of opinions about. So what I might suggest is that if you have questions, do put up your hand. I'll try and avoid getting into very detailed discussions during the talk. But I do want to let you guide the, the talk as well as obviously my own thoughts on, on, uh, on Ireland's property market and how we got here and where to next. In terms of what I, I hope to cover today, really there's just a few simple rules that I want to get out into the, sort of the general um, discourse when we, when we think about the property market. And this is from the point of view of, of buyers or sellers of property or renters of property, but also from the point of view of policymakers. If we can get these types of rules or stylized facts, as social scientists like to say, if we can get them into government thinking, it's unlikely we'll, get, we'll find ourselves in a similar situation again. So the four stylized facts that I'm going to base the, 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 the talk around, the first is that real estate is a bad investment. The second is that the property market is imperfect. The third is that accommodation is a service, and we need to remember that. And then the, the last... Uh, is that governments actually can have a, a proactive role in managing the, the housing and the property market, but it, it needs to view itself as uh, an organisation um, or a regulator that is managing a market rather than, uh, I suppose, intervening for the sake of intervening or, uh, or not intervening for ideological reasons. The context of this, given that it's the Dublin City Libraries, the context of this is that we've seen it all before. If you look at the price of a Mount Joy Square townhouse after it was built in the 1790s, uh, in all its grandeur, before the Act of Union, it would have sold for around £8,000 um, back in the day. Less than a lifetime later, it had fallen by 94% um, to £500. So we're, we're not living in unprecedented times from the, the, the point of view of the property market. Certainly, the the crash that we're seeing in Ireland now is among the biggest in the developed world at a national level, and it's, it's certainly in the, the top tier, the Premier League of property market crashes. If you start counting, for example, cities or states within the US as their own economies comparable to Ireland, Ireland is certainly mixing it uh, among the countries that has had the, the most violent bubble and crash. But certainly if you keep your perspective long enough, um, this is not uh, something that is unprecedented property prices rise and property prices fall and we've seen pretty dramatic episodes of that in Ireland in the past so going back to the, the sort of the four, this will be the sort of the outline um, of, the, uh, of the talk as well, so real estate is a bad investment, um, it's sort of odd, um, particularly if you associate me with a sort of a daft.ie hat on, um, to be, for me to be coming up here saying, you know, don't get your hands on, on property, it's not a very good asset to have um, and particularly when you see the conventional wisdom, uh, if you go online, uh, you'll see either Mark Twain said this by land, they're not making it anymore, or uh, occasionally you'll see uh, it attributed to a Don at an Oxford college or a Cambridge college saying, well, we've done pretty well, they're not making any more land, let's just hold that. So that's the sort of conventional wisdom around uh, property and around real estate. If they're not making any more of it, grab it now because the price is going to go up. But I suppose an economist would say, well, if everyone knows that, then surely the price will already reflect that, um, rather than uh, nobody realising this and you're sort of ahead of the curve. Uh, and, in fact, we can have a look at this over the long run. I've already mentioned something from the 1800s. Um, this is the, the, the Herengracht, which I think means the Gentleman's Canal in Amsterdam. And this was built just in the heyday of the Netherlands, the, well, I suppose the, the early heyday of the Netherlands in the 1620s. Um, just after it broken with Spain, and it was the global financial centre, and uh, and they built this this canal, and it's one of the, the reason that I, I mention it is that they have every transaction ever on the Herengracht they have recorded in the archives, all the way from 1628 right through to 2012, <coughs> and in the 1990s, uh, an economist did a study of transactions on this one street. So you know you're not comparing sort of different cities or you know you're not comparing different house types. You're actually looking at sort of 50 properties traded over and over again for hundreds of years. And at first glance, you could make the case that um, you know, property prices seem to go up. Um, there's, there's ups and downs there, but um, 
But definitely, if you look, and this is indexed, so uh, the price when it was built, when these houses were built, is set to 100. And you can see that, uh, that it goes up, and it seems to go up, uh, albeit with a wild swing, it seems to go up there towards the end of the period. And if you actually extend that a little bit, that goes to 1962. If you extend it a little bit more to 1972, you have to reset the scale, and you can see, well, actually, you know, in those final 20 years, prices did seem to rise dramatically. So what am I here saying that you know, property prices don't go up over time? It's not a good asset to have. Well, this guy did the study. What he also included was uh, this is nominal prices, so this is just what you see on the accounting ledger. But it, he also included real prices, so controlling for inflation. And obviously general inflation comes and goes, and it's, it's also sort of swings and roundabouts. But when you adjust for inflation, this is property prices in the Heron Gracht in Amsterdam over almost, well, certainly 350 years. And soon when they update this, it'll be nearly 400 years. And you can see there's certainly ups and downs, and there was a long period there where it was above the average, and then there was a long period. That's about a lifetime. This is about a lifetime as well, but it was below the average. But certainly <coughs> that red line is the, uh, is the average for the whole period. And as of 1972, you can't really see any difference from the long run average. There's a little bit, but not a lot. And in fact, if you were to just take a simple trend and say, well, what's the trend in this? The trend is actually down, and that the real price of the property goes down. And clearly, it's not a line. There's, there's sort of peaks and troughs. So there are, there are property market cycles. There's certainly no evidence from this one street in Amsterdam, um, for which we've really good <coughs> information, that real property prices, once you've accounted for inflation, are that they go up. So, Robert, yeah. Sorry, very quick question. Uh, are you including rent in that? That is, uh, it, that is property prices relative to the cost of living. Now, the cost of living, um, as you measure it going back into the 1600s, it, it's probably going to be based off a, a, a simple basket of goods. I don't think rent is in that. No, no, no. What I mean is, this is an investment on which somebody was getting a rental return on. Oh, oh yeah, no, no, this is, that, let me come to that bit later on. Yeah, yeah. So this is, um, this is just the conventional wisdom that if you buy your own property, that you'll, you, you can make lots of money out of that. And that when you, when you die, your property will be worth an awful lot more than, uh, than, than when you bought it. Um, and what this is saying is that, well, certainly you can make the case that house prices match inflation. So your house is a good store of value. So if you were to get all your savings now, let's say you have 100,000 in savings and you put all in the property now, um, what this is saying is that uh, at any given point in the future, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but our expectation is that in 20 years' time or in 50 years' time or in 100 years' time, that 100,000 will have kept its value. So if we've switched to the, the new Irish punt or if we're in a Euro 2 or if we're in the Euro, whatever happens, that property will more or less keep its value but it certainly won't increase its real value. And if you look at the literature, there's not a big literature on this. Um, studies like the one for Amsterdam are, are, are kind of rare. And one, of my, uh, one of my research ambitions is to construct something similar for Ireland over the same period. But certainly there's evidence from the US over a shorter period, say 100, 150 years, that the same thing happens. If you look at, there's one on commercial real estate in New York and there's one on house prices in Boston, and again and again on these studies, you find that <coughs> property is very good at matching inflation, but never really beats inflation. And by contrast, if you have a savings account, that will typically beat inflation. Now, this is obviously not taking into account any explicit rents. If you're a landlord rather than an owner-occupier, a landlord will get rents, and that might, that might change the calculus. But certainly, if you're, if you're just looking at it for capital gain, you're unlikely to, to get it in, in property. But surely Ireland is different, and this is, you know, what, uh, if this would be the slide I would have shown in 2007, you know, is Ireland going to be any different? And it looks, there you've got this very nice sort of exponential curve of house prices. This is based off, I should look at the source at the bottom, based off the Department of the Environment statistics, merged with later data points like the DAFT uh, index and the CSO index. So that gives us one index going from 1975 to 2007. But again, this is just without correcting for inflation. And also, it's ignoring what happened after 2007, which 
are obviously all very familiar. So if you do both those adjustments, if you add in the extra couple of years, but more importantly, if you correct for changes in, in uh, just everyday prices, what you see is a very different picture emerges. This is in, uh, in current euro terms. So the figures there are what 100,000 euro is now or what 400,000 euro is now today. Um, and you can see that the average house price was about 100,000 euro in 1975, got up to sort of 375,000, and has fallen right back down to about 175,000 as of the, that is the last quarter of 2011. And what's particularly interesting in this graph, we can come back to this bit later on, is the first bit. Uh, that looks a bit familiar, doesn't it? That looks exactly like the Amsterdam picture. Up to 1995, you had sort of bubbles and crashes, or booms and busts, maybe, if we want to, be, if we want to have a, a boom to be a small increase and a bubble to be a big increase. We had sort of booms and busts here. Um, but certainly, the overall trend is, is flat. So again, I don't want to be too repetitive on this, but from a policymaker point of view and from our everyday lives point of view, we shouldn't be expecting anything more than house prices to match inflation. And this has big implications if you bought during the bubble, if you bought in 2004, 2005, 2006. What is your expectation about the value of your property in 10 years' time or in 20 years' time or in 50 years' time? Um, Typically, certainly up to 2006, 2007, people would have said, well, property sort of increases at 5% a year. We're a bit above that now, but that's what we think property prices do. That's sort of the, the conventional wisdom. Well, what I'm saying here is really we should be thinking more like 2% a year because that's what the rate of inflation is. Well, that's what we're targeting as the rate of inflation. So that's what we should be targeting as the rate of increase in house prices. It also has an impact for everyone in Ireland in, in some sense. If you bailed out a bank, which we all have, if you, and if you took over some of these loans, and if you now manage these loans as we do through NAMA, what is our expectation for the value of property in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time? What's our, our expectation about long-term economic value, which is NAMA's watchword? Well, really, you know, if we're thinking 2% a year growth in, in property prices, that's very different to perhaps what, um, what Brian Lennon envisaged originally when he, he introduced the mountain legislation. I think he had sort of a 5% a year model in his head. And this graph just takes a scenario where uh, property prices fall by about 60% to 150000 uh, in next year and then increase by 2% a year after that nice and smoothly. And obviously we know there'll be future bubbles and future busts, but we don't know when they're going to be. So uh, without knowing them, let's just say, okay, 2% a year. And it's a useful exercise because it tells us when we might see property prices reaching their peak level again. And uh, they reached their peak in 2007. Um, by this stage, I will be hopefully retired in the 2050s. We don't know how long people in my generation will have to work before we get to retire. Um, but I hope to be retired by the time we see prices reach the same level again. And that's, that's important for, for policy as well as important for our own everyday lives and when we buy property. That's the first, um, the first sort of bullet point. The second one is that the property market is imperfect. And here I'll talk a little bit about sort of economic theory. In a way, I was implicitly giving out about policymakers um, for the last few minutes, saying what their plans were about NAM and so on. Now I get to give out about economists. Um, uh, so economics is about assumptions in a way. And that might sound like a bad thing, but obviously we need to make assumptions. If we want to make any sort of model of the world around us, if we want to understand how the economy works without actually just replicating it completely, we need to make some sort of assumptions. Um, the, 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 the issue around assumptions is that some assumptions are made um, just to simplify, to strip out unnecessary detail. We don't need to know every last little bit and bit. And so we'll just simplify and assume that, whatever it might be. The other category of assumption is made not out of simplification, but out of necessity. We actually don't know how something works. So in the absence of knowing how it works, we'll just assume that this happens. And uh, the danger in economics is when you mistake one for the other. When you say, for example, that, oh, well, there's no markup that, that, um, that producers, when they sell their goods, don't enjoy any markup. 
you might think that's just stripping away unnecessary detail. And there is going to be some markup, but let's say it's 10%, but that 10% doesn't matter. When we want to understand markets, we'll just assume that there is no markup that, that producers enjoy. Well, maybe the markup matters in a way that affects the outcome. So if we're, if we're looking at equilibrium, or if we're looking at disequilibrium in a market and in flux, maybe these things matter. And I think a lot of what went wrong in economics was this, uh, this mistake, mistaking uh, a simplification out of necessity for one out of luxury, that we, we don't need to worry about this detail, but actually it was detail that was crucially important. We just don't understand it. And an obvious example of that in sort of very big macro models is um, that most models, this is going to sound funny, but most models in economics, most macroeconomics models, don't have any money in them because money is regarded as an unnecessary detail. And that you can express prices in something else. Money is just a form of wealth or a unit of account. Let's just say there's something over here called wealth, and we know how to express the price of goods and services anyway. So we don't need money. That's all well and good until you've got a crisis in your financial system, until banks stop lending to each other and to households and to businesses. In which case, understanding how money works is very important. And that was a, a classic mistake that, that macroeconomics in particular made uh, over the sort of period up to 2007. And it's really just sort of getting on top of all this now, realizing there's one, one guy a, in Oxford has a paper called <coughs> Putting Goldman Sachs into a Model of the Economy. And you know, it's, it's this idea about how do you put investment banking, how do you put um, liquidity crunches and uh, liquidity traps and credit crises, how do you put these into a model of the economy? That's all very highfalutin. How does this relate to the Irish property market? Well, one of these expectations that economists like to make is called rational expectations. And rational expectations means that people aren't stupid. That's its motivation, and that sounds you know, like a reasonable assumption to make. But de facto, what it means is that consumers and firms, but in particular consumers, can process all the information that's out there and come up with a completely balanced judgment out the other side. And this might be the case 30 years from now when we've got supercomputers that can take all these market signals and give us an answer of whether to buy or sell. But certainly now, and definitely 30, 30 40 years ago, people didn't have <coughs> little models in their head that were crunching these, these types of regressions and coming out with coefficients. We just don't do that. And the question is, do we not do this to an extent that affects the outcomes? And the argument I would make is that in property, yes. In property, what we tend to do uh, not just in Ireland, but it, generally in property, is, is take the last five years, or maybe a longer period, but certainly the last five years, and use that as the basis of our expectation for the future. And this obviously gives the property market some sort of like, it, like it's, it's, it's an extrapolative path. But because we buy now based on what we think prices are going to be in the future, um, that has an impact in terms of the prices today. So if you think property prices are going to go up by 5 or 10% a year over the next 5, 10 years, you're going to pay a lot more now than if you think prices are even going to maybe be stable or even fall. So our expectations are hugely important in the property market. And if our expectations aren't rational in that economic sense of the word, if they're adaptive, that has a big implication for, for boom and bust cycles. Boom and bust cycles will tend to be amplified if we have rational expectations. That's really just that point there in the headline. In terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the, one of the questions in the title was, how did we get where we are? We got where we are. We got such a vicious bubble and crash cycle by managing to tick every box in the, you know, the theoretical bubble. Um, there's a book by a guy called Kindleberger, and I, I presume there's copies in the library, and it's a classic text, and it's, it's reissued every sort of five, ten years to update with the latest bubbles. And the start, it, out, it outlines what is in a crash, what's in a bubble and what's in a crash. And one of the first things that happens in a bubble cycle is something comes along, some shock comes along. It could be, traditionally it was, you know, a new king uh, is put on the throne, um, or maybe a new government is elected. More recently, we tend to think of technological shocks that we discover something we didn't know before, and this changes people's expectations about the future. Ireland's sort of favourable change in conditions was uh, moving from 1980s stagnation to 1990s growth. This sort of changed the path of the economy. If you ask people in 1987 
what they thought the economy would be like now in 2012, um, they would have had a very different answer than if you asked people in 1997 what they thought 2012 would be like. Uh, so that was an initial change, and that gave us an initial momentum in the mid-1990s, both in terms of economic growth and employment, but also in the property market. Now, you, that in and of itself is not enough to cause a bubble. To, to sustain a bubble, you need an increase in the supply of whatever you're having the bubble in, be it tulips or property or uh, shares of a particular company. And you also need some way of getting credit, because really prices only get crazy when people can borrow. Um, otherwise, there's only a limited amount of income. If people are borrowing and leveraging up so that they've got savings of 20,000 and they can borrow 200,000, that's really what adds fuel to the fire of a bubble. And in Ireland, we managed to tick both those boxes um, really, really well. Um, so entering the Eurozone gave Irish banks, which had a history of never really being able to get credit in, on international capital markets, they found it very difficult to borrow because Ireland was a small economy and was quite volatile and susceptible to, um, to attack by speculators or the markets in general. All of a sudden, these Irish banks were in the Eurozone and had access to, in particular, German savings, but just generally access to, to credit. Uh, so that was, the, that was the accelerant. And then uh, to really seal the deal, um, to suck everyone into the bubble, you needed a fresh supply of houses because if there was only a set amount of houses, then not everyone would have been able to take part in the bubble. It might have been bad in a, in a price way, but it wouldn't have been bad in terms of sucking in as many people. So to suck in as many people as possible, you need an increase in supply. Typically, bubbles are about shares, so the company issues new shares. What we did in Ireland was we managed to have a huge increase in the supply of property, and that brought a lot more people in. And when that ran out, we just bought property abroad. So there were all these factors, there were all these boxes we were ticking about the stereotypical bubble and crash cycle. Um, but as of 2005, 6, 7, all these factors were here. That, that's not the clearest, is it? And there's three different shades of grey there. Um, but it's, uh, it's analysis of the ESRI and IIB, which is now um, uh, KBC. Uh, they did consumer sentiment surveys. And they did them every month. But uh, in January, they asked them what were their expectations of the property market. And you can see it doesn't really matter which group you look at, long-term owners, recent owners, people who want to buy, people who are <coughs> looking to invest, people who are, aren't in any way interested in buying property. They all s didn't see the end of the, the bubble. They saw a slowdown, particularly uh, optimistic where the, the people who wanted to buy, they said, no, I think property prices are going to increase by just 3% rather than 7 or 8%. But all of these factors that I mentioned on that, that slide, they were there throughout this period. And, and yet people just looked at the last five years and said, what happened over the last five years is the best guess for what will happen over the next five years. Sorry, can I just maybe sure. is there one factor that might be left out of an important factor because of the sort of hierarchical or inequitable nature of society that a lot of people, both in the media and in the economics area, had a vested interest also in speaking up the market. Um, I, I, sorry, I don't yeah. mention because taxes and uh, oh, you know everybody's getting cut out. I, I think the weakness there is not so much that they wanted to talk up the market knowing that they were talking up the market. I think it was a blind spot. So they were talking up the market because they honestly believed it. Um, I, I think if you were, if you were in, if let's say you, you've got the sort of the, uh, when, when, when things go wrong, it's either because uh, people, were, people were evil or people were stupid. Um, so either we didn't see something coming or we saw it coming but still went that way anyway despite knowing the consequences. And I, I think of it as the stupidity rather than the evil. Um, yes, there was a, a vested interest, but I think it was blindness. That the, the people who were, had a vested interest couldn't see any weakness. Um, and if they, if they were able to see the weakness, they would have got out of it. They would have kept talking it up, but they'd have got out of it. But all these people, um, and I, you, see, you still meet them. Um, you know, I, I meet people now, and they, some of them saw a bubble in property, but sold their house and bought bank shares. So where instead of seeing a 60% fall, they saw a 99.9% fall. You know, it, it wasn't that, it, and it wasn't that no one saw it. Um, Morgan Kelly turned his attention in 2006, but David McWilliams had been saying it since 2001. Um, the people who were talking it up honestly believed it. Um, otherwise, they would have sold out. 
uh, and they didn't sell out. So, and that seems, you know, that so many people could believe so so strongly in it. Where does that come from? It's almost like a mania, a, a madness, or yeah. a, you know, a, a fanaticism attached to a particular idea. Yeah, and, and maybe that's a, a bullet point that's left out of there. Um, I don't know if it's a fourth on that list or if it's just a separate point that needs to be made. But part of what makes a bubble and a crash so bad is its intoxication, is that if everyone is seen to be making money, then everyone does start believing that this time it is actually different. And the best example I can come up with for that um, is Isaac Newton wrote about this bubble. I think it was the South Sea bubble in the 1720s. Um, that, now, my timing could be all off. He could have been long dead by that stage. No, but I think it was the, the South Sea bubble in the 1720s. And he uh, wrote about how stupid it was in 1721 and said he couldn't believe that everyone was being sucked in by the South Sea bubble. And in 1724, he took his life savings and invested in the South Sea because he thought maybe he was wrong. And in 1725, he lost all his money. And for the rest of his life, he went to let him mention it in his presence. So uh, if, it can get, if it can turn really, really smart people stupid, um, that just shows the, the power of the bubble. Uh, and it also shows why we should be so vigilant and doing the best we can to prevent as bad a bubble from happening again. And, and a lot of that was at, a, <coughs> at an EU level, but also at a domestic regulatory level. It was about getting used to life within the Eurozone. We prepared for entering the Eurozone, but we never prepared for life in the Eurozone. And what it would mean for our Irish banks to have access to practically infinite credit. And what would it mean for the Eurozone for all these banks to be able to deal with each other without any currency risk? Nobody really prepared for that. And certainly, um, if you could have tackled that, you could definitely have tackled this, and you would have taken the sting the last five years out of the bubble. You wouldn't have been able to prevent the bubble entirely. That was, you know, there was always going to be some element of increase in credit, increase in property, and increase in growth that would have led to a, some sort of bubble. But perhaps maybe no more than sort of this kind of bubble, maybe a little bit bigger, but that, that kind of bubble and crash. Sorry, there didn't seem to be an analysis or a study of the situation that had changed. Like, they didn't go in and analyse the situation. People, say, government. Yeah, so, so government should have been aware of Kindleberger's book, for example, uh, and should have been saying, rather than, uh, there's a, obviously Bertie has his famous quote, um, about he doesn't know how people don't go off and commit suicide. But there was another quote where he, in 2006, said, um, because of all these experts telling us house prices are going to fall, people didn't buy in 2005, and now house prices are even more expensive in 2006. And I hope those experts you know, are ashamed of themselves, basically. Um, you don't want that kind of attitude among your, your elite. You don't want them, for whatever reason, to be just picking some bizarre, uh, arbitrarily picking some asset and telling people to buy it. And that's not the kind of country you want. You want a country where, if there's dissent, that dissent is factored into policy-making decisions. And that wasn't the case. Um, not for this talk, but a broader talk about public service reform would be getting dissent into the system. If someone disagrees, get them in. Get them to explain why they disagree and see if you need to strengthen your policy proposal on the basis of their disagreement. So people didn't see the end of the bubble, and currently people find it hard to see the end of the crash. So... Recently, this is with my daft hat on, we surveyed 2,000 users of the site about their expectations of the property market. And uh, they perhaps correctly feel that average prices are going to fall by about 10% in 2012. But then you ask them about the next five years. What do they think? Where will house prices be in 2017 relative to now? And only about one in six saw house prices being anyway higher in 2017 than now. And that's only slightly bigger than the proportion of people who thought house prices would be at least 35% lower in 2017 than today, than January when they were doing the survey. So the, there's a, the, that works on the upside and the downside. As prices are increasing, people find it hard to see the end of prices increasing. And when prices fall, people find it hard to see the end of property prices falling. And we are going to, we're going to turn around one day and realise that the the crash is long over. We, we, we won't turn around and realise the crash ended yesterday. It'll be a situation where only after a year or 18 months do you realise, but well, you know what, actually, the crash ended about 18 months ago. And that's, that's the way it works because the statistics are murky and it's difficult to know exactly when things turn. Um, 
and also because of adaptive expectations. People find it difficult to change their, their uh, sentiment towards the market. So accommodation is a service. So I've said that you know, when we think about the property market in our day-to-day -day lives, don't think of it as investing in real estate. Think of it as buying accommodation. And accommodation is a service. This is, if, if, for those of you who know your national accounts, we, we calculate our GDP by adding up consumption, investment, government, and trade. So leave out the government and trade for the moment. Um, housing is consumption, it's not investment. Building houses is investment, that's fine. So, but we need to think of, of property as a service, not as, not, as a, not as an investment. And I would caution against, you know, sort of, uh, to, we talked about Newton there a few minutes ago, I'd, I'd caution against Newton style economics, what goes up must come down. Um, it seems appealing, but uh, in terms of you know, what we should expect in terms of house prices, I'm not saying that real house prices necessarily have to go back to 100,000. That's what we did see in Amsterdam. That's what, we, that's what the literature generally points to. But we shouldn't just think that that is always going to happen. If we go back to that Amsterdam graph, there were periods when the average was higher and periods when the average was lower. So economics is not what goes up must come down. Economics is supply and demand. And we can pretty much take supplies fixed. The uh, sort of urban economists and housing economists tend to do this anyway. Um, that housing is quite a slow thing to, the supply of housing is quite slow to move. Even if people start building now, it takes a number of quarters, maybe even a number of years to get a real change in the supply of housing. But specifically in relation to Ireland, there's so little construction activity at the moment. Uh, and that's unlikely to change anytime soon, that we pretty much know the supply of housing in Ireland for the next five years. So if supply is fixed, then we need to look at demand. And typically, uh, people look at the sort of the income to house price ratio. That's the easiest for an individual household to do, because they know their income, and then they just multiply out and say, okay, well, let's say four times our income, and then we get uh, a house price, and that's our budget for housing. And that's about affordability. Um, and if we look at house prices relative to incomes, we can go back to 1988. I haven't yet found good income data before 1988. But we can, if you look at 1988 to 95, and 95 was sort of that cutoff before things changed, the average house price was about three and a half times household income. Now, household income is different to the average industrial wage. Household income is, if you've got, um, let's say, 1.2 jobs for every household, that means every fifth uh, household has two people working in it, you need to factor that in. And that did change a bit. We went from sort of um, every sixth house having a second income to every third house having a second income, second full income um, between 1990 and 2005. Now, that's sort of a, that's just for your own, um, that's more sort of like a, a postscript or a footnote that when you're calculating your household income, we're looking at the country, you don't get sidetracked by the average industrial wage, you do actually know that you have to multiply it up by something. Anyway, that's for the mathematicians among you. The point of this slide was that up to 95, you were talking about three and a half times household income was the relationship between the average house price and the average income. Uh, in 2005, 2007, we'd gone to twice that. We'd gone to about seven and a half times um, the average household income. And what you can do is you can actually do a nice exercise and say, well, if we had never gone above sort of this long run average, what would house prices have been? in Ireland and that's the dotted line in here so how should house prices have evolved if you believe that this income ratio is the best way of calculating house prices uh, and you can see that it was roughly right up until about 1996 and then house prices increased a lot faster than they, they should have but the fall has been a lot greater because the fall of income hasn't been as large as the uh, even taking into account unemployment hasn't been as large as the fall in house prices, and perhaps optimistically we can see that the gap here in 2011 quarter four is actually quite small. Uh, if you believe this this house price to income ratio is what matters, what I would say is that um, we need to be careful with the income ratio. It's a symptom, as I say, it's affordability. 
it's not actually the root of what gives a property a value. It's not the cause, it's the symptom. Uh, and some of the increase in house prices may actually be due to the fact that Ireland went from a high interest rate environment to a low interest rate environment. Suppose incomes never changed, but we went from uh, Ireland having an average interest rate, as you can see there, of say 12%, to Ireland having an average interest rate of, let's say, let's say 6%, 12% and 6%. Then you would expect house prices to, to possibly double because the affordability banks ultimately go by what you can afford on a month to month basis and if the interest rate is half of what it was then that those first few mortgage repayments are going to be roughly speaking half not not quite but something like that so maybe some of the increase we saw in house prices is just to do with the fact that we've gone from being our own sort of our own economy battling against all the odds to being a bit like one of the US states safe in the comfort of the eurozone of course, we all know it's not as straightforward as that, but let's say safe inside the comfort of the Eurozone. And really, when we think about the value of property, ultimately it comes from rents. It comes from the value of the service that someone is enjoying. So, for example, income multiples won't tell you why two houses next door to each other are very different in terms of price, or why one city is more expensive than another city. Um, so when we're calculating that GDP, um, figures and we're adding up consumption and investment and government and trade. One of the most important services is what's called imputed rent. And this is what owner occupiers enjoy as they hold some of their wealth and property. They enjoy a rent that they never have to pay. But what is that rent? Can we understand what that rent is? How much it would be if you were to try and rent out the same accommodation you currently own if you own accommodation? And in that sense, the ratio of rents to house prices is much more fundamental to what property is worth than the ratio of incomes to house prices. This is just a summary of some of the academic research I'm doing. It's, it's trying to figure out what gets capitalised into house prices. And there's all these different services that we have that are reflected in the price of houses. But to, how to read this is, if, you're, if this is going from one kilometre away from a particular meeting to 100 metres away, so if you move a property from a kilometre away from the coast to 100 metres away from the coast, the effect is about 10%. You increase the value of the property by 10%. These are the different services. You can, the coast is one. Um, there's a, if you're close to a, a, a polluting factory or facility, um, you get like a, a 1 or 2 percentage point penalty for being close to a, a polluter. Being close to a primary school seems to have a big negative impact, um, which is a bit counterintuitive. You know, why would being, why would be... I would be close to a, a primary noise. school. It's noise, it's congestion, it's the lack of parking spaces. These things get factored in. Um, part of my next phase of research is to separate out small schools and big schools and with secondary schools, progression rates to third level education and see if people are willing to pay for good schools rather than schools where, which have a poor record or which are maybe large classes, whatever it might be. What's the second one on the list? Um, so that's bathing, that's actually beaches and bathing <coughs> facilities. Um, so being close to a beach rather than the coast, or in addition to the coast, has a huge impact, especially in the bubble, um, but also in the crash. Um, and then there's a comparison of urban versus rural, and then prices versus rents as well. So as I say, a lot of the detail here is superfluous to today's talk. But the point of this slide is to show that an awful lot of things get factored into to, to house prices and into rents, because these are services that we're paying for. And the value of a property is it's the number of bedrooms, it's the type of property it is, it's the size of the garden, it's the amenities that it, that it has access to. Uh, and that's, if we, can, if we can think in those terms, we're much less likely to ever get caught out with, with bubbles and crashes in the future. We will never be able to prevent them entirely, but we certainly won't accelerate them as we did in the, in the past. So... This is um, maybe, if, if there are any potential first-time buyers in the, uh, in, the, in the crowd, this is maybe the most important slide. Think like an investor. Uh, if you have a property that rents for €800 Euro a month, that's annual rental cost or annual rental income, if you're the tenant or the landlord, uh, of about €10,000. And what's happening in the fire sale auctions at the moment is people are looking at these, these €10,000 <coughs> rental income apartments or houses and saying, right, okay, that gets me 10,000 a year. I will give you 10 times that. I'll give you 100,000. 
In a healthy property market, they may say, I'll give you 15 times that. I'll give you 150,000. But they work it out as a multiple of the annual rent. And that's a very <coughs> sensible way for a first-time buyer to think. It's easier to think in terms of your own income because you know what your own income is and you can multiply that by four pretty easily. But if you lose your job, how much is someone else going to be prepared to pay for that property? It's nothing to do with your income. It's to do with how much you would rent for. The services that that property offers you. Yep. What about the effect of rent allowance? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, that. That is. Um, I, it was the. If I'd had an hour and a half, I would have oh, gone into yeah. rent allowance. So the rent supplement scheme is potentially keeping rents higher than they otherwise would be in most parts of the country, with the sort of honourable exception of um, Dublin South of the Liffey. It seems. Um, if you look at the thresholds for rent supplement and you look at prevailing <coughs> rents. They seem very close. And uh, Minister Joan Burton is actually reducing the thresholds for rent supplement. Um, and the idea there is to try and let rents determine themselves naturally, find out what people are willing to pay, and then give people assistance based on what the natural price is, rather than the taxpayer footing the bill and keeping rents higher than they otherwise would be. Um, and that obviously has a, an impact on competitiveness as well, if, if accommodation costs are higher than they need to be. But that's a very good point. Um, it's something to be aware of. If you're if you looking at a particular property, is rent supplement keeping the rent higher than it otherwise would be? And we should find out in the next six months. But sort of where I'm going with this is that you can also look over the last sort of 50, uh, not 50, what it'll be 35, 40 years and see, well, what is this relationship between rents and house prices look like? And does that tell us anything about the bubble? So this is the... The yield is just the annual rent for the average property relative to the, the house price, the purchase price. That's the blue line. And the interest rate is the prevailing interest rate for mortgage borrowing in Ireland. And these go from 1978, so that's why we start then. And you can see there seems to be, sort of, I don't know, something weird happening in 1978. The CSO is just getting on top of its various indices. I wouldn't worry too much about that. But what you can see is, generally speaking, particularly at the crucial period comparing say, the, the 80s and early 90s with the late 90s and noughties, um, that you can see that the yield is very closely related to the interest rate. And in fact, maybe rising house prices in 1996 were actually justified by Ireland being in now, instead of this 12% interest rate country, by being a, something like a 6% interest rate country. And that's what you're seeing here. Interest rates go down significantly and house <coughs> prices rise but you can see there with the, you can't really see it easily with the yield. But we know from the last graph that house prices start rising in 96, 97. The damage was probably done, in my own opinion, when interest rates were kept lower than would normally have been the case because the German and French and Italian economies were anemic when Ireland was booming. So this, I would argue, the 6% is where interest rates will probably be in the Eurozone in the long run, but we had interest rates of sort of 4% rather than 6%. And that lured the yields down from where it seems to have been quite comfortable down for, for at least a couple of years. It, then people said, well, hang on a sec, it looks like we're going to have really low interest rates. Not 6%, we're going to have 4% interest rates. So that then sucked the yield further down. And the problem is, as soon as interest rates went back up to normal levels, this is the green line going up here, the property market was hugely exposed because prices had increased relative to rents far more than they should have. And you can do, um, you can add in a third column, not just the income ratio but actual prices. You can add in a third column which says what should house prices have been, so sort of since 1978 or whatever, uh, what should they have been? And you can track that and you can see that. Yes, quite a good bit of the bubble is, <coughs> mightn't actually, certainly when you think back to should they be at 100,000, quite a good bit of the bubble was probably just Ireland changing from a, a, a high interest rate environment to a low interest rate environment. But certainly there was a, a substantial chunk of the bubble left over um, that, uh, that was pure bubble. It was nothing to do with incomes, it was nothing to do with rents. Uh, I can go, if anyone is interested in the mechanics of exactly how that's worked out, I can do that. It's, it's probably... <coughs> well beyond what we've got time for today. Okay, so this may be why you're here, some crystal ball gazing, I don't know. 
when is it all going to end um, in terms of price falls? Well, asking prices are down by 52%. Certainly they were down by 52% on average by the end of 2011, from their peak in mid-2007. And that, that sort of hides an average of, it masks difference between Dublin and the rest of the country. Dublin is something like 56%, and the rest of the country is something like 48%. Uh, and there'll be a new DAF report actually at the plug-in. New DAF report out in the first week of April, which will have <coughs> figures for January, February, and March. But let's say that house prices have fallen by a further 5% since the end of 2011. And let's say that when people actually trade, and you go and you buy a house, now you don't go, I'll give you your asking price. You say, I'll give you your asking price less 10%. And there is some research that I've been doing with the central bank that says this is roughly accurate. And certainly up to the end of 2010, the average discount between the asking price and the closing price is about 10%. Now, if those two things are the case, then the average price is down actually 58%. Uh, and this, if you, for those of you who are um, avidly watching your news yesterday, now Brendan McDonough, the chief executive of NAMA, was into an Oireachtas committee, and he used the same figure. He said 57 58% is what he thinks house prices are actually down, property prices are actually down at the moment. I know there was another report that said more, but that was based only off cash sales. And mortgages are still an important part of the market. So that means, based off the... Was the transaction price in 2007 not actually higher than the asking prices? Uh, I mean, wasn't there a trend in 05, 06, 07? Auctioneers put houses in the paper at 250,000. And got and more. Then, and then people started bidding at 260, 270, 280. Yeah, that is that certainly just even bigger. Certainly, in two thousand five, two thousand six, that was the case. But two thousand and seven, you have a period where um, you've got the transaction prices start to fall, but asking prices don't realise there's an asking price to go up to where transaction prices were and stay there for a while and then come so down. Two thousand and seven. Yeah, there was a ten percent. So um, sorry. So uh, as of really, asking prices were completely static throughout two thousand and seven. Technically, the peak was middle of 2007, but you're really talking about very small differences throughout the whole calendar year. But transaction prices had already got to that level and had started to fall. So it was taking time for sellers to realise that buyers weren't paying as much. So and there may be a small element of that, but I'd argue that you know, 58% is roughly, roughly right. So that means the average transaction price, um, which, as you can see, peaked there at whatever, 365,000, <coughs> is down at about 155,000 now. So now meaning April, May, June this year, maybe. Um, well, 155,000 doesn't look too bad at all relative to these um, so the income multiples, or if you don't like income multiples, um, rental multiples. Both of those would suggest that we should be in or around that. So am I saying that you know, house prices are going to level off as early as April, May, or June? Uh, well, I think I'll give a, the typical economist answer, the, t the two hands. Uh, on the one hand, I think, yes, I think prices are quite close to the fundamental level. There's a, there's a caveat there about rent supplement. If rents go down a lot, that will affect this red line here. Um, and there's obviously a caveat about incomes. Yeah? Just with prices stabilising, if you're looking at, say, there's less job security, and then in the public sector where there is job security, there's no income security. And yeah. almost everybody expects to be earning less than two years' time than they are now, one way or the other. Yeah. So it comes down to statically, we're not, we don't look like we're too far away from fundamental property values. Um, there's a caveat about uh, rent supplement, um, and that would affect the red line. And then there are people's perceptions of what their income is going to be, and that affects the dotted line here. So if you feel that your income, if you feel that incomes in general are going to be maybe 10 or 20 percent lower, if that's the correction we still need from where we are. Or if you feel that rents are going to fall, for example, due to rent supplement <coughs> revisions by 10 or 20%, then there's further downside. There's perhaps the more important thing that w whatever happens, say, on incomes, I actually don't think incomes are going to fall. I don't think this figure, the, do the dotted line, is going to change by too much. I think on average, we are, like, we are where we are. No, on average, um, we, I, on average, I think incomes are going to be roughly the same they're going to be maybe plus or minus 2 or 3% on the average 
but I don't think they're going to change dramatically. I think the big correction in incomes has already happened. I think uh, there is scope for, for rents to, to fall, um, and that will pr probably have an impact. But I think much more important than that is that whenever we get to, I think we're there now, and we may have to move as the fundamentals move, but I think we're close to fundamental value. But the problem with housing markets is their boom and bust. And they overshoot on the way up and they overshoot on the way down. I, wouldn't, I would never recommend trying to game a market and find out when it's overshooting on the way down and buy really low in the hope that you've got quick gains. I'd recommend looking at the fundamentals. But I do think we are <coughs> going to have a situation where property prices overshoot relative to the fundamentals. They, they go down just because of that momentum. Because people look at the market now and say, I couldn't possibly see prices increasing over the next five years, so I'm going to hold off. And that has an impact. So uh, in terms of the, the crystal ball gazing, you know, are we close to fundamental value? Yes. Does that mean property prices have <coughs> bottomed out? Probably not. Isn't there some rationale in that in the sense of there's no great, no great confidence in the economy because of the debt money that's taken out of the economy, the state of the banks? Um, you know, so there's no great sense of you know, that we could, you could base that, you know, because if there's money taken out, um, it, it's probably there's going to be less jobs and people, you know, they're going to be cut back in spending power. Yeah. Which is a vicious circle. And that's, and that's, yeah, and that is sort of affecting these fundamentals. If people's income is cut, it will actually be reflected in the red line as well, that, that rents fall when incomes fall. So, uh, and it will also obviously affect this line here. And, and the more you believe, uh, or anyone believes, that our fundamentals are going to be affected, it's not just a cyclical thing, that we are actually going to have to step down, and that is going to get reflected in the property market. So, just because I think they're close to fundamentals, doesn't mean that anyone else has to. The fundamentals can easily move. Um, as things get worse, the fundamentals obviously are getting worse. I think there's a big difference between rural and the city in Dublin or Like people say, and Dublin seems to be getting help from their parents. Like down the country, there's not as much money there. Prices are much, much only half of what they are. The, the interesting thing is that um, when you look at how far they've fallen from the peak. Prices in Dublin have fallen by a lot more than prices in, say, Tipperary. Uh, prices in Tipperary and in Limerick and Mayo and Kerry, I think, are the, the, the most reluctant to fall. Um, they have fallen by perhaps um, 48 to 50 percent, whereas, uh, no, sorry, um, 40 to 42 percent, um, whereas prices in, in some parts of Dublin are down by 60 percent. Um, yeah, now, uh, I actually would be, I would be of the view that the cities are going to recover first for, um, for a number of reasons. A, they seem to be further down the, the adjustment process. Um, but, but more importantly, oversupply is tiny in a relative sense in the cities compared to some counties. Yeah, and that's going to have an impact on the supply, obviously, and an impact on the price. The other side is the demand. People want to live in cities because cities are better job creators than, than small towns and villages. So if you are young now and you're looking at setting up your, your future, you're unlikely as you were. We, we sort of got a, a, a buy. We got like a 10-year pass on the economic laws of gravity about cities. Cities suck people in. During the sort of last 10 years of the Celtic Tiger, we got a reprieve, and people were able to live wherever they wanted and work. Um, but that's not going to be the case over the next 10 years. And that's going to mean that demand in the cities is greater than, than demand rurally. And supply is worse, the sub oversupply is worse rurally. So I actually think if I were to map it out, I would see Dublin and Cork City levelling out first. And remember, it's levelling out. Recovery is levelling out, not increasing if you go back to the very start. Um, okay. I'll just go to the, yeah, go to that slide and then we can. Can you clarify on your income graph there? A lot of people <coughs> have work their salaries are frozen at the 07 level. And so in absolute terms, they're still receiving the same amount. But in inflation terms, they're short by about 4.5%. How is that income graph factored in? Is it absolute or is it inflated? I was, I was aware of this point, and the short answer is one of them, one of the first graph uh, was actually inflation adjusted. Um, but the, the second one wasn't because it's harder to do when you've got rents in there as well. So for, for ease of comp comparability, I, uh, I... So you can see that it doesn't really matter when we're looking at 2011. 
the gap doesn't really change. The inflation thing is, is certainly relevant when you're looking at the past and might be relevant in the future depending on your belief about inflation. But uh, it doesn't really change the conclusion too much about where we are now um, if you use nominal or inflation adjusted. I know I'm pushing quite close on time. So I'll, I mean, you've, you've got a sense of my overall view on you know, getting this, these ideas into the policy-making system so this doesn't happen again. Very, very briefly, in terms of quick ideas for what the government can do proactively, one thing is to be aware that intervention was part of the problem, and the Irish property market was one of the most intervened property markets as of 2006. The tax incentives were so skewed that that's not a, that's intervention for the sake of intervention is not a, a solution. But you can do things. Um, the market does need to be managed because it's not a very good market. It's got boom and bust cycles because of adaptive expectations. Sensible land use you can promote via site value tax. That penalises people leaving land backs empty, penalises bad uh, or inefficient or socially unrewarding use of sites. And it encourages people to, to use the land as best as possible. You can encourage sensible lending by requiring banks to do covered bonds. This is what the Danish system does. If you want to lend over 30 years, you've got to go out and borrow over 30 years. And when you go out and borrow over 30 years, you find out pretty quickly what people believe the interest rate over that period is going to be. And therefore, you pass that on to your consumers. And it means it would be a lot less susceptible to what happens in the ECB in terms of month-to-month -month decisions. And the, the last one is sensible borrowing. And this is softer. This is about sort of the information infrastructure that people have. Um, but the publicly available house price register will be a large part of that giving people the information to make the decisions. So that's where I leave it because we've used up all our hour. But uh, I'm happy to do your questions as well, but I know some people may have to, to get back to work. Just one question. It, it's not mentioned in, in any of your slides, but do you not think our problems really began in 1977 when rates were abolished? Local councils had no money. They did build houses. Now, yeah. I know that a lot of people think they wouldn't get a house. But if we had a continued the way we were going, they wouldn't have been forced onto a market so inflating the price of houses. Yeah, I know I, I worked in the bank and I was told before I left, thanks to the God, I thought that the way they were managing the thing was wrong. And I was told politely from my boss, if you don't want to do a trade, there's 15 people out there who will. And I was telling them that's wrong to add that into the company. Try to bring them up to the mortgage rate. They were bringing in their bonus at all times and every little hit they could get. And I, I fundamentally disagreed, and I was told very politely that they wanted to do somebody else's work. Well, I was leaving, so it didn't matter. But it, to me, I think back in 1977 was when we made the first mistake. Because then we cut, took no taxes on any house, even. Yeah. We had no rates. The local economy had none. And now we're complaining about 100 euro tax on houses are the thing, which is minimal. And it does to keep our roads clean, clean our uh, parks, the grass cut in our parks. And keep our livelihood open, then I'm not quite sure the home will go Yeah, I, I completely agree, and that goes back to the, the last, the second last slide there about uh, intervention. And one of the interventions, one of the worst interventions, was removing any form of taxation, yeah. um, because then it became a vote winner. You could get elected by saying, "I'll, I'll abolish whatever last tax there is in the property market." Mm -hmm. We saw that right through to 2007. If you go back to the, there was the, the, the table with all the different amenities. Yeah. Other research has shown that if you're close to a park. Your, your property price is higher. Yeah. And if you have a tax, like a site value tax, that reflects the value of your land, yeah. you, you, you've got a direct way of funding uh, local authorities to maintain parks, to, uh, to build new homes, to you know, whatever it might be, to maintain the amenities that they have. Yep. Ronan, excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. And learned a lot from it. Um, I agree with you generally, but I don't think you should be making a bold statement uh, in, in its own silo. Investing in property, property is a bad investment. I think you have to say property compares to cash, bonds, and equities as follows. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yeah. I, I think you have to look at the two of them. I mean, you said, for example, that cash has kept up with uh, uh, cash has kept up with inflation. Uh, inflation. But you didn't, you didn't, you didn't apparently put in the rent on property. So if I had 20,000, which I think was the average price of a house in 1975, in a house, today it's worth 150,000. If I had 20,000 to deposit, 
uh, it's still about twenty thousand in nominal terms. Yeah, no, that's so that's yeah, that's a fair I, a fair call. I think, and you know, I, I defer to you, but I think property has outperformed cash over the last thirty or forty years, uh, and I would say historically it has outperformed cash as well. I don't know what a few Dutch guilders were. <laughs> Were worth in 1640, you know. <coughs> but uh, uh, I, I would imagine it's the same over there. I would imagine the, 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 the you know, whatever price you could buy a house on the Heron Strasse, I don't know, <laughs> would be a lot higher now. Yeah, no, um, that's, uh, I mean, uh, that's a, f a fair comment. And, and really, the point I was making was it was trying to uh, bring some contrast to these, the sort of the stylized idea that people have. As, as you say, I, it is true that if you bought a property in 1970 and it was whatever it might have been, 20,000, and now it's 150,000 or 200,000, you know, that's, that is true. But I, um, I guess the point of my slides was that don't expect that to happen again. It, it, might, it might happen if inflation does it. So that's, that they were, re well, they weren't even real values. But let's say you go to real values and you say you've got an increase in the real value of housing. That mightn't. We shouldn't be expecting that to happen again, but I completely take it. I'm gonna, I'll, if I give this time talk, I will be adjusting. And in fact, I want to include a point about equities, but I, I had a data source, but I didn't have the time to crunch the numbers. Well, maybe we finish it up there. So thanks very much. For <laughs>